Good morning. Today we are talking about storytelling time, which uh, for our tribe is now. Um, the, there was the first snowfall, or depending on which clan stories you're listening to. Um, so Carolyn is here with me um, this morning, of course, to share some of her knowledge <laughs> with us. Um, so we'll begin with um, just the basic question, why, why are stories told? Well, thanks for asking me uh, to be the expert again. <laughs> I just want all our relatives to know that I am i know my place when it comes to all of this, so I'll tell you what I know, and I've gathered this information from reading um, and from um, David Smith, Helene Lincoln, and all these folks that I've worked with here at the Travel College, uh, especially the older uh, traditional folks or who knew this kind of thing would tell me things about it. So that's all I'm sharing is what I know. And my mom too, she would kind of share some things with me, but she uh, left, um, you know, left the reservation a long time ago. So um, she didn't have a real grip on everything and she used to speak the language too. Funny thing is my mom had a stroke and she spoke Winnebago again. Really? She was in the hospital room, she was talking. Ho oh, chunk. Really? Yeah. And when she was kind of want to hawk at the time, you know, because mm -hmm. she had that stroke. And then when she finally came home, I said, Mom, did you know you were? She said, No, but I was dreaming. Mm -hmm. So in her stroke, she was dreaming like when she was out, you know. Yeah. And she was dreaming about um, my grandmother and living here and talking. When they were little girls, they spoke Ho chunk, you know. Oh. So it's just like. I think the brain is amazing, so I, I always think that all of our stuff is in there, but we have to be willing to get it out. Yeah. And that's the way with the stories, too. The stories um, are really important to our culture because they are a um, an account of our history from the beginning. Because we have different kinds of stories. We have origin stories, which are the stories that talk about where we came from, and uh, this is a big uh, archaeological and uh, ethnological argument between uh, academics and uh, elders in the tribes because the Ho-Chunks hold to the fact that we came from Red Banks, like the origin story. Whereas some of the academics say that we came from the South, from Central America. So there's that kind of dialogue that's going on, but the stories are also about migration. So there's origin stories, and each clan has their own origin story. And from what I understand, those origin stories are told in uh, uh, medicine lodge ceremonies, but they're not told out in the public by every clan. Every clan is, some of the stories, uh, I know I had a snake clan student once who I, I had the kids go and find their story, their, or, their clan origin story. And the Snake Clan, and uh, there were a couple other of our clans that were not supposed to talk about that in public. So there are certain protocols that go along with these stories. And as, as my esteemed colleague Sunshine said, you know, uh, we were supposed to wait for the snow to be on the ground. And when I taught here, I always made sure I taught storytelling tradition in the spring semester after the snow had fallen so I, we could talk about those things. So, and there's reason for that. And I asked somebody one time about the re why can't, why do we have to wait for the snow? And they said, because there's spirits and entities that want to steal those stories. And if they steal your story, it's kind of like stealing your identity as a people. You won't know where you came from or who you are. They might change the story and make it bad and nasty and horrible. So you got to be careful and protect those stories. And the giants would come and, and listen on the outside and steal stories and steal your kids if you didn't pay attention to them and watch over them. So there's all those kind of stories too that tell us how we're to behave as parents, as children, as clan members. And so there's millions of stories. And um, scholars are finding that they have to, they're wanting to research and know these stories because the stories also confirm uh, evidence of what the earth went through. Like the Ice Age, um, there was a time, oh geez, it must have been 20, 30 years ago, there was a concern that the earth was passing 
through a tail of a comet. And um, the astronomers and the astrophysicists weren't sure what would happen. Because mm -hmm. the tail of a comet's made up of big chunks of ice and, and chemicals and stuff. And they weren't sure if this would scorch the Earth or if it would cause uh, mass destruction or, or whatever. But they referred back to the stories of the tribes. And if you go back, uh, like this happens every so many years. I think it's like every 123 years or something. So they tried to trace back these stories to that exact date when it happened before. And there's a Lakota... Um, Oh, what a winter count robe that shows the exact year that this happened before and it showed and the story would had been passed down through a family that that was the year the, st the stars fell from the sky and the story goes that when they started attacking the village they were talking about these stars falling uh, when actually they were passing through the tail of the comet when they were talking about that, the men ran outside with their bows and arrows. And if they had guns, they were shooting and they were defending the village against these falling stars. Because to them, it was an attack from the heavens. So in the winter count, we made it. And nobody got hurt. Nothing happened. The dinosaurs didn't disappear. They were already gone. And uh, so the astronomers were pretty assured that we would make it through again. And we did. We passed through the tail and everything turned out all right. And uh, so today we find a lot of these stories are being uh, really studied by the academics and the geologists and whatnot to try to determine if we survived this cycle before. Because if, you're, if you know anything about the Earth, it goes in, she goes in cycles. There's a cycle when she has, she passes through tails of comets. There's cycles when she has floods, when she has earthquakes. And so they're really looking at a lot of these stories to try to figure out, what, one, what the people did, and two, what really happened. So these are very, very valuable and important um, um, retellings of what our history where we came from, how we survived, and all of those kinds of things. <clears throat> and unfortunately, the academy, the universities and stuff, tend to label them as myths or legends. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's really wrong. If anybody ever says that to you, oh, we just love your Indian legends, you know, that's a bunch of BS. Because they are not legends, they are true re retellings of our history and how you interpret them, and of course they're told in English now, which is a really boring, dead language. Descriptive is crap, you know. Uh, if we could retell them in our old language, they would be just beautiful, big murals of what happened and exact information about how much it snowed or how much rain there was. And, uh, but we don't know that anymore, unfortunately, and it's being lost, so we need to really uh, recapture these stories and I'm, I'm happy for Sunshine and for the Renaissance Project to try to keep that language because uh, um, Helene Lincoln used to tell me, oh my, my grandmother and grandfather used to talk about these stories and she said it was just beautiful. It was hard uh, not to quit listening because it was just like a video in front of you, you know, they painted these pictures. so. That's why it's important that we keep all these pieces to our culture, the language, the stories, you know, good, bad, and indifferent. And uh, so there's a lot of different kinds of reasons why these stories are kept. The other thing they do is they tell us our law as a people, how to behave. You know, what is it we're supposed to do as young men, as young women, as children, as elders, as grandparents. There's a story that talks about everything, um, talks about where our, the Medicine Lodge came from. It t even tells you what happens when you uh, make your journey and pass away. You're gonna, your spirit's gonna go to this place and you know, if you're a, if you're a war uh, veteran and you die in war, you automatically go to the, to the uh, sacred place with your ancestors and if you're not, 
If you're a med medicine lodger, if you're this person, you do that. If you do this, you do that. We don't have a hell in our stories. There's no story here about anybody who went to hell. We have hero stories. That's the thing that I like about our Ho-Chunk storytelling is that we have so many heroes. Um, and they do incredible things. I mean, it's better than Avengers, actually. <laughs> I think. I mean, we have... Uh, there's a story about Heishushka. I think that's how you say it. Heishushka, Redhorn. I think that... Anyway, I'm sorry. I don't speak the language very well. But Redhorn was one of our superheroes... And there's a whole um, cycle of his stories from birth to death. In the stories, he's one of uh, Mauna's sons, Redhorn is. I think he's the third one, maybe. And he was sent here, the story goes, to kill the giants. Because the giants were eating the Ho-Chunks and killing them all off. So Mauna felt pity and he wanted to send one of his sons to kill the giants. He sent the first son he had, his name was um, Harris Janina, and he was deformed and only had one leg, so he couldn't do anything, and uh, Mauna felt bad about that, that his son wasn't able to kill the giants or really do much of anything. He was handicapped. So he gave him a job to do in the underworld. In the old Ho-Chunk teachings, there's an underworld uh, and they, they compare that with the underworld that was taught to the Maya and the Toltec and Olmec from Mexico. They have an underworld. Their underworld is not such a cool place, but um, Ho-Chunk underworld, Harris Janina is there, and it's not that it's a you don't want to necessarily live there, but he's watching over it so that everything goes right. And then the second son was Turtle, and then he had... Um, Redhorn, and then he had hair. Now Turtle, oh no wait, there was Bladder. Bladder too, there was like four or five of his sons. Bladder was <laughs> sent down to kill the giants. and But what Bladder did was he was just real cocky and arrogant and full of himself. And he got all of his brothers killed. All of his cousins killed in war. Because he said, let's go to war. That's all he wanted to do. And then Turtle came and he created war for the humans. And then uh, Redhorn came, of course, and he had a success in killing the giants. The whole story cycle of him is very long and complicated. Yeah. And he had twin sons who um, got involved in the giant killing business. And um, also, Redhorn was a big hero. He was a good wrestler. And he used to wrestle around, but he kind of had an eye for the ladies, so sometimes the women would throw him off his game. <laughs> but he had these two boys, and uh, giants cut the head off Redhorn one time after a wrestling match. They uh, cut his head off and took it, and the boys, the twin boys, said, we'll get our revenge. So they chased him all on down, clear to the Great Lakes. They went up there, and they finally got his head back. And there was a big bunch of stories that goes with that journey of getting Redhorn's head back. And Redhorn was then, his head and his body was reunited, and then he went on, you know, to be a great, great chief. Now, another interesting thing about Redhorn, and there's a, there's a true story um, from the migration that goes along with it. I could tell it if you want, but yeah, it's, like I'll that. make it quick. Redhorn... Um, was a good fighter and warrior, and in, uh, let me see when is that, 950 AD, Redhorn tried to negotiate a peace with the Mississippian culture, we were living over there, um, because they had been at war with them for hundreds of years. And he said, you know guys, this is dumb. We're doing resource, we're burning up resources, we're killing off our people. Let's declare the peace. So, you know, they're men. So they say, okay, you give up. No, you give up. No, you <laughs> give up. So this is, you know, you give up. It'll look bad for me and my Ho-Chunk people if I give up, Redhorn says. So the great priest of the Mississippian said, no, you give up. So finally Redhorn says, wait a minute, let's have a ball game. Isn't that Bagel Boy's ancestry, you know? We're going to play a ball game, and whoever wins has to give up. 
So they played a ball game and it's that old uh, ball game from Central America where the hoops on the side of the wall, they don't use their hands, they use their feet and hips and legs to hit that ball through that hoop. Well, the Ho-Chunks won eventually and the Mississippian high priest, in those days what you did if you lost, you don't want to be on this team because they sacrifice your head. Yeah. So they cut the head off of these players and hung him on a rope and he gave him to Redhorn. And Redhorn later on, instead of wearing that rope of heads, his head, earrings, his, his gauges were human heads. And we see artifacts that have Redhorn, they call it the big boy pipe. He had those human heads and his gauges and his ear, ears. So he wore them and those served his advantage when he was trying to wrestle or kill the giants or whatever the story goes because those heads were alive and they would wink at you or stick their tongue out and make fun of you and so that would throw his his uh competitor off and he would win he would pin him or kill him or whatever so that's where that red horn stories supposedly come from now uh david told me that story um and i read some stuff about it too in the ho-chunk encyclopedia but um Redhorn was an incredible hero. Um, so that's the Redhorn. And we still have Redhorns today. That's a family name. Yes. And uh, um, that story, I always remember it. And I always tell kids that story. They like to hear that, you know, heads getting chopped off and ball games and those yeah. kind of things. But that's a bunch of different stories. And then there's a story, Hare, is, Hare that rabbit, is one of the sons. And he brought... Uh, the medicine lodge to the people. Now he was kind of a dirty old, he was kind of a shady character when he was a young guy. He liked to chase the girls and mm -hmm. you know those kind of things. But he was born of the Mother Earth and uh, the story goes that he impregnated Mother Earth himself. Which you know, I suppose them, you know, them rabbits are born in a little den in the ground. Yeah. I suppose that's what it means. And so when he was born, um, he wanted, he loved the two-leggeds. He loved us humans. And so he wanted us to live forever. So he told his grandmother Earth, or his mother Earth, he said, um, you know, grandmother, I want them to live forever. What can I do? What can I give them to help them live forever? And she said, you can't let them live forever because then everybody will go hungry. They'll be diseased. There's not enough room. Um, because at that time, some of the other uh, entities in our storytelling were immortal. They couldn't yeah. be killed. Uh, so he, he was one of them. And he said, well, what should I do? So he, she said, you have to pray on it and think about it. So he did. And he decided that he would do this for the two-leggeds. And he brought the medicine lodge. And he made the lodge and taught the humans about that lodge. Every part of it is one of our clans. The, fr the frame is the snake clan, and the buffalo sits on this side, and the deer on that side. You know, he, I don't know all of that, but there are stories that tell me. He taught that. And he said, if you follow this medicine lodge way, when you pass, when your spirit gets ready to go to the spirit world, you have a choice. Your spirit can stay and wander around the earth. Your spirit can go to the spirit world where it's, you know, everybody's waiting for you. Or you, you could come back. So we have a little bit teachings and stories about reincarnation. But I know uh, when I first started working over here on the reservation, there were old timers, uh, Felix White and uh, some of those old guys. I would visit with them about these stories. And they said that sometimes a baby is born and you know it's the spirit of one of your ancestors that went. So like your grandpa or your great grandma or somebody. So they feel their head and their ears and try to figure out if they're one of those spirits that came back. And I think all of us have, we've had a kid or a grandkid that was an old spirit. Yeah. And that's what the hair brought, were those opportunities as a human. We can stay here on the earth and wander around like a lost spirit. Uh, like, uh, what do they call them? Uh, uh, it's Wanagi in Lakota, but it's, uh, hmm. what is the spirit name in Hampo? No. No, that's owl. That's an owl, yeah. 
It's oh, Wachapini. Is it? Yeah, I think it's Wachapini. Don't call in if it's not Wachapini. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> it's not Sunshine's fault. Um, but anyway, they can stay. And so we have those spirits that wander around. We all know that from our teachings. And, you know, my mom used to talk about who is in the house and those kind of things, you know. So, you, you know, it's not like those scary horror flicks where the ghosts are, you know, horrible and doing horrible things. They're just spirits who decided to stay. Yeah. So you feed them or you, you know, and when we have that traditional meal, we sit on the ground with them. And you're not supposed to lift your plate because they're eating too. You don't want to be rude. Yeah. You know, there's all those stories tell us why we do these things. So you got to have them. You got to remember them. And, and of course, they change a little bit with time. And we know that. But the major teachings and tenets of those stories never change. Because they used to be told so much over and over and over. There wasn't TV. There wasn't radio. There wasn't Facebook or anything like that. And if you were telling them in your house, if you were a grandma, grandpa that was in charge of keeping those stories and that history... The little kids would keep you straight. You might change the story a little bit and they'd say, Oh, Choka, that isn't what you said last time. So, you know, you kind of got to keep your story straight because the little ones keep you online. And that was part of the deal too. You know, if you're going to be a storyteller for, the, for your clan or whatever, uh, you better keep it straight, you know. So each clan had their storytellers? Yes, I or think was so. was it just one clan's job? No. I don't, the way I understand it, everybody had their, like every, even the societies had their society stories. Mm -hmm. Like if we had a, a women's society or a, the veteran society, they had their war stories that they kept. And the women's societies had their, you know, their women's stories that they kept. And uh, their society history, protocols, law, some tribes, uh, even us Ho-Chunks, Almost every tribe, the storytelling tradition is also lays out the law, how you're to be, and what if you violate the taboos that go along with that. So they're very important. And uh, um, I know when I first started learning about the Ho Chunk stories, I was just amazed because if you take any tribe stories and you go back and look at the geologic history and the weather history and the migration history, you see it's true. And none of it was written down. It was all word of mouth and people just kept it. And if you were, um, some tribes, like I know Ho-Chunks kept uh, cave pictures. There's a big uh, series about um, Redhorn. It's called the Redhorn, uh, anyway, it's on a cave. And then, um, the and Lakota, that's in yeah, it's in Wisconsin. Yeah. I think it's by the Great Lakes, but my, maybe by the Mississippi. And then the um, Lakotas keep the winter counts. Mm -hmm. And every year the big bellies would gather around, and they would uh, they would um, decide which picture was going to go on the winter count that described the year. So, like when those uh, meteorites came, and when if they went to war, if there was a war, and Custer's battles even on one of those winter counts. So, so um, just a bit ago you were talking about stories that um, talked about our laws within our people and um, how that is upheld. And um, speaking of that, because um, we've lost a lot of these stories, um, why do you think that we've lost them? and? How can we bring them back? Well, I think we lost them because of the colonization and yes. the genocide. They didn't want us to tell them because in the mainstream, in the European, in the Eurocentric sense, you know, they have stories too, like who believes King Arthur pulled that sword out of the stone? Yes. But, so they didn't want us to have those stories of ours where, you know, a guy's head gets cut off and puts back on, he has human heads and earrings, um, or can time travel or fly or whatever. So they condemn those stories, so the oppression. And then the next thing, when they take your language, it's done. 
you know, your stories are, how can you tell your stories if you don't have your language? And let your stories have the same meaning. That's why it's so important today that we capture them back and uh, reinvent them in English so they have the same meaning. Yeah. And then put them back into Ho-Chunk. There's, there's places where those stories, I know in Wisconsin they have them in, uh, they have them you know, cataloged with, in the language. You can get the language where somebody's telling this story in Ho-Chunk. But until we do that, you know, we're going to lose our history and our morality is taught in the stories too. How you should be as a yeah. human being, you know. And it explains things sometimes. These stories tell us why things are the way they are. Why do we have to wait till the snow is on the ground to tell the stories? Well, because in the beginning, when we were first put here, Mahuna put us here, the giants were eating us. And they were, you know, they don't come out in the snow, I guess. Or the snakes don't come listen in the snow. Somebody can't take your stories. So we have to wait. And then when that happens, it's safer. It's not perfect, but it's safer to wait until now. And then if you think about it, socially, you don't want kids laying around in the house listening to stories in the summer and spring. There's gardens to till, work to weeds to pull, work yeah. to be done to get ready for the winter. So you don't want, you know, everybody gathered around, laying around, doing nothing, like playing video games today, I guess. They need to be out getting the lodges ready and getting everybody ready to face the winter. Yeah. And then once that hard work is done, you can come in and relax and everybody can sit around and eat dried berries and stuff and enjoy soup and enjoy the stories and then remember them. So there's a, you know, there's a practical reason to it too. Um, I know my mom used to always throw us outside when it was nice weather. Well, she threw us outside when it was bad weather too because, you know, you get on your mom's nerves after a while. But, <laughs> you know, in the spring and summer, you want your kids outside working yeah. and, get, and learning how to survive the winter. So, you know, that's probably why they were told in the spring and summer too. Yeah. Okay, so we were talking about why have stories and storytelling been lost? Um, and how can we bring those back into our homes? Um, well, first of all, I think we carry a lot of shame as a conquered people because we say, oh, well, we don't know the ways, we don't know our traditional stories. But you know, um, time doesn't stop just because we were conquered or we lost our language or whatever. So you can tell the stories of your own family that you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that, you know, um, they don't necessarily have to be that, you know, you had an uncle who wore human heads as earrings. Yeah. But it can be whatever that story, that struggle is for your family and how they got here and what's going on. To teach kids those um, and to share with each other bits and pieces because that's how you put together the whole, the whole encyclopedia of your family. And, it, you know, no one can tell you, oh, that's not right. Because you have this right from your, your ancestors, your grandma and grandpa and your mom and dad and aunts and uncles. So you need to put that together for the children to tell those stories and share them. Get everybody off their dang phones at the dinner table and tell stories. And then I really think there needs to be a push for the school board and the community to tell the school you know, we really need to bring these traditional stories into the school and have a, a kids have it as a class all the way through high school. Um, one time I was teaching a dual credit class when I was here down at the high school and I had a kid stand up and say, oh, that isn't what we did and all that kind of stuff. And I said, why do you say that? He said, I don't believe half the shit you tell me. Mm -hmm. And I was teaching a history, Winnebago history class. And this was in high school? Yeah. And I said, why not? It just seems unbelievable, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, then prove me wrong. Give me a different history that you know from your ancestors. Oh, they won't talk about it, blah, blah, blah. You know, and so that's the attitude is that 
Well, and that's the attitude the conqueror put on us, was that your stories are dumb and wrong and stupid and not true, so you can't tell them. And we're going to take your language so that you lose your um, freedom and your culture. And so that's what they did. And so then we went, you know, after, you know, we're like, oh, man, I guess we can't talk about that anymore. And it really needs to be taught in the, high, in the schools so that little kids growing up know that um, they came from these strong, wonderful, powerful people that carried their DNA through 11 removals mm -hmm. in the contemporary times. 11 removals since, what is it, 1821 or whatever it was, or 1600. And here we are able to sit in this beautiful museum, air conditioned, climate controlled. Uh, we're still here. That's amazing that we're even still here. So kids need to know that story. And then they grow up telling their children and on and on and on. And it, it really gives you a pride uh, in yourself and in your people that will carry you through hard times. If you remember those things, you know, you can make yourself uh, make it through those hard times. And I really think that that's important. It needs to be done in the school. I know I tried to do that with my grand son is tell the stories of my mom and my grandmother and this you know reservation and um, he's Omaha so I try to tell him those kinds of things and every time he comes to visit me he asks grandma tell me this story about grandma tell me this story about the time you were in the army tell me this story you know so all of those family things need to be passed on and then as we go, then you add in the old stuff and go back and back and back and add in the, la the language. And that's how you have to do it. And it's hard. It's hard because there's a lot of, a lot of uh, old kinds of transgenerational shame and whatnot that goes to it. We don't want to talk about it. Maybe we don't want to talk about how, uh, um, you know, how my little brother was killed. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about that. But you have to tell people, tell the family and the kids what happened, because little kids know he got killed, but then they're always going to grow up with, gee, we don't talk about it. Yeah. And you have to, because uh, you don't want it to happen again. You know? And explaining stories and explaining protocols, then you learn, okay, I'm not going to let that happen again. You know? So that's hard, and there's a lot of, we have a lot of sadness in our families. I don't care who you are. And so it's hard to talk about those, those sad things because we've been taught by the mainstream, ah, you don't talk, that's stupid, and we don't talk about those things, you know. And then all of a sudden, as a people, we say, oh, it's our culture not to talk about them. Well, that's not right. Yeah. And no matter so, what it is, whether it's murder or suicide or incest or abuse or or accidents you know we just don't want to talk about it and you have to because that's how you heal and uh so um, for all of us like to for myself or for you how you started to bring these stories back into our home we want to just start talking about our family and right you know sharing these stories and maybe just starting out you know with one or two stories that you remember and then over yep. this next year learn some more stories but also what we need to do as a whole people is not criticize each other for oh you don't do that we don't do that we yeah. don't do that you hear that a lot throughout yeah. our community or um so then that is uh or that's sense. not how the story goes well then teach me how it goes yeah yeah let me tell me what do you know because yeah. our collective knowing is hooked to ancestors 2,000 years ago mm -hmm. on this continent. So our collective knowing is hardwired way back. So there's remote understandings and remote knowing that we need to bring out again. And uh, I had somebody told me one time too, and I think it was uh, one of my Lakota teachers said, um, you may not know how to do a ceremony or what prayer to say or what happened, but the spirits know. So you have to take your time and sit with them and they'll teach you. 
and then you do what they say and tell what they say, no more or no less, you know, and then, then the truth will come back, mm -hmm. and then you'll know. So I spend, you know, I mean, I'm an old lady now, so, um, but I spend a lot of time in that kind of prayer with the spirits, trying to have them teach me more yet. Yeah. Because I have grandchildren, and I want them to, I want to leave them that knowledge. And uh, it's hard. And I don't speak the language, so that's tough. I try to uh, keep things alive with songs and ceremony, because I follow that Lakota way. That's a different than the Ho-Chunks, I know, but I try to keep that alive in that way. And uh, I had a neat thing happen this last weekend. My little granddaughter came to a ceremony we had. She didn't go, we had a sweat lodge ceremony. She didn't go in, but she was sitting outside and she was telling um, my partner and my uh, uh, brother and sister-in-law, oh, I know every one of them songs. I know every because she's been in the sweat lodge since she was about this big, but I know every one of those songs when I'm in the lodge and when I get out, I can't remember. Really? And they say that's way, the way it is, you know. But, uh, so I thought that was neat that she could say that. She's... 10 years old. Aww. Yeah, so it's like, I know every one of them, she said. I, I know every word. She was just bragging about herself, which everybody liked it for her, you know, that she could do that. And that's a common, even among adults, when we come out, then we're like, oh, I don't know how to sing that. How come I was <laughs> singing? And, and there's, a, there's a term for that when you go into ceremony and you know, you, and all of you out there probably experience this at ceremony where everybody's speaking Ho-Chunk. Mm -hmm. You know what they're saying, but you don't know the language. But yeah. your spirits are saying, oh, they're praying for the earth, they're praying for the stars, they're praying. You know. And because your ancient connection to that language and to that story and to those prayers is always in you. But until you're sitting there and really in a good sacred space, you think you don't know until yeah. it comes out and then you know it, and then you're like, oh. And um, one time a person, an old timer, told me that's called the vibration of the first light. And that when our first humans were put on this earth by the Creator, when they, they were dropped on the earth or placed on here, they made a sound. And it's kind of like when you're surprised, you know, like, oh, what am I doing here? Yeah. You know? All of us have that. It's called the vibration of the first light. And so when that vibration starts and those first prayers and that language starts, you just know. Because you heard it way back. Your ancestors heard it. That's what I believe anyway. I don't know. If you don't believe me, I'm sorry. But <laughs> that's what I was told, you know. And so I believe that. So when I need to know something or how to do something, I always sit with the vibration of the first light and let them tell me. And sometimes they say, you know what, you don't need to know. <laughs> Get about your business. No, I'm just kidding. So and so we need to do it in the schools. Families need to reinstate storytelling, whatever they know. Yeah. My mom used to tell me a lot of stories about Winnebago uh, when she was growing up, and she used to always tell the story about her and three or four of her friends. They used to go climb up on top of the old school. There was a chimney or something, and they would brace their feet against one side and then shinny up uh -huh. and stand up on top of the school at night and look around and see what was going. And mom said one time her and my auntie were coming home and they used to live down here by, uh, uh, at the edge of town, there was, there's a row of houses there. My grandma's house was there. And they come walking across that field. She said it was just weeds then yeah. from the old school. And they'd get to the highway, which was just gravel. And then they would walk up the hill and she said something started following them from the school. She told she used to tell us these scary stories that happened and she said her and her sister, my Aunt Lou, they would they said she said, Lorraine, something's following us. And mom said, Oh, it is not. My mom was like that. He said, Look. So mom said they stopped. It stopped. They looked around and it was it looked like it oh, somebody with a blanket on. Really? And so she said, so then we started going again, and it stayed just so far behind them. It didn't catch up, but she said it followed them. And so then they started running, and they got scared, <laughs> and they ran across the road and up the hill, 
and there was one street light down there on the highway. And mom said when they got to the top of the little hill, they looked back and that thing came under that light. It didn't have no face. Oh my goodness. I know. And so they went it home and I can't remember the exact reason, but they, they couldn't get in their house. So they ran across the road to, uh, there was a woman, uh, she was a veteran. Her name was Genevieve Johnson. Mm -hmm. And she passed away here a few years ago. But her, Genevieve Lowry, I think was her, maiden name and her and her mom lived across the road so mom and them said they went to her house let us in because there was a light you know and their yeah. grandma my mom, grandma wasn't home or something and so Genevieve said what's the matter with you girls she said there's something chasing us and they looked back and that thing came around the corner and stopped at the edge of the yard so they got in the house and slammed the door and uh, mom said they kept looking out and it was gone but they were afraid to walk across the street to their own house because my grandma wasn't there yet. So <laughs> she used to tell us that story and just, we live way out in the country, just scare us to death. <laughs> so we'd be looking outside, you know. But then she said that there were stories about them, uh, uh, wachopinis, those spirits that wandered around with no face. Mm -hmm. There were stories about them back then. And if you were not behaving, or out. Yeah, out when you're, when you're not supposed to be, they could follow <laughs> you around. So she used to tell stories like that. And then another time she said, uh, somebody brought one of the medicine lodge gourds. I don't, you know, I think they use a big gourd in their ceremonies in the medicine lodge. And they said uh, to my mom, Lorraine, look what we found. And mom said when they brought it out of the bag, she just went like this because she knew there was something, and my grandmother had told them, don't mess with that stuff. Then. You just don't mess with any of those kind of sacred things. And so my mom said, she asked her, where'd you get that? I found it in Grandpa's room, blah, 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 you know. And she said, listen. And that woman, her friend, you know, I suppose they were 10, 12, I don't know, shook that road, that, that gourd, and mom said off to, across the garden and across the field to the north over there, she heard something go, Lorraine, Lorraine. That's my mom saying, come here. And so my mom, I made gourds later when I was doing uh, sweat launch stuff, and she said, those are ghost rattles. She called them a ghost rattle. She said, you shake that, it'll call the ghost. I have never had that luck, but... <laughs> But that gourd was a medicine lodge gourd and it was calling them spirits. It was calling my mom's name, Lorraine. <laughs> she said, I told her, you put that away and take it back and get out of here. She got real scared. So, <laughs> so you know, who knows those stories? Somebody must know those gourd stories and how they came about. And... Yeah. But because of like colonization or the boarding schools and all the genocide, yeah, we're, we've lost. So now it's, it's our turn to bring it yeah, back. Yeah, we got to get it back. And I would look for that story because my mom told me that story. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've kind of, there's uh, stories in the storytelling, in the Ho-Chunk storytelling tradition about the gourd. So there's stories about, you know, of course, corn, bean, and squash, and then the gourds, and, you yeah. know, all those things are all related. So I don't know the gourd story, but I haven't spent a lot of time looking for it. My mom, she was so funny. That's a ghost gourd. Ghost rattle, she called it. A ghost rattle. <laughs> like, gee, she used to tell us these scary things that happened in Winnebago, that there would be spirits wandering around and stuff. I believe that. Yeah, yeah, I do too. People still see stuff down at the river and whatnot. Mm -hmm. The first thing I always said was, were you drinking? Yeah. Well, so maybe. <laughs> I said, that's why them things come after you when you're doing things you're not supposed to. Yeah. That's what my mom used to say. You got to behave out there because they come. Didn't stop me from misbehaving for a while. <laughs> she was right. Me either, but she was tired. right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's all for the video today. I think we covered everything and talked about how to bring them back, what we need to do at home for ourselves. Yeah. And, um, it's hard work. I'm not saying, oh, it's easy, we just have to do this. But 
we all have to study and learn and remember and tell the stories. There's nothing wrong with that. And it gives kids uh, in the Hawaii, they created schools where this is where they all they taught for the first three or four years of their school. And those kids don't drop out of school because they're proud of who they are. They have those stories to rely on for what to do in this situation and that situation. Uh, they have their superheroes. Yeah. They have their teachings. So they have that to fall back on. And they, and they do well in white man's school and they finish. Mm. And that's, you know, they're called the, uh, they have a name like, Hanawawi, you know, that Polynesian word, I don't know what it is now, but it's called the immersion schools. Mm -hmm. And that works. Yeah. It's I hard work though. Here. It's hard work. It is. But it can be done. But I wanted to thank you again for joining me here and Anytime. discussing with this. I love learning from you every time that we talk. So thank well, you. Well geez, you've had a few years at it. Come on. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And no, thank you for inviting me. I'm real honored to do this, and I don't know everything, you know, I just don't, but I'm, I'm willing to share what I do know, and it's important work it is. that you're doing, and Ben, and Jordan, and everybody in here, and this, the way you've got it set up now, you folks ought to come down and see the artifacts. They're just incredibly powerful. Thank you. I hope they do show up, and thank you all for watching. <laughs>